Hello, everybody. My name is Asa McCurdy. I am a first going into my second year master's student studying under Dr. Lee Miller with turf pathology here at the University of Missouri. My research is focusing on locating lance nematodes in turf grass putting greens, specifically creeping bent grass across Missouri. And a lot of that research takes place at South Farm, and a lot of it takes place at the nematology lab and here in Waters Hall as well. So nematodes in general are very small, microscopic, unsegmented soil microbes. So whereas a worm that you would see crawling around on the ground has different segments to it, nematodes are just bariform, all in one shape. They're ubiquitous among all soil types and most environments. You can actually find them in the ocean as well. A common saying is if the earth just disappeared, you'd still be able to see the shape of it due to all the nematodes that were going on. If nematodes were the only things left and earth vanished, you'd still be able to see the shape of the earth. Inside of soil and water as well, you have plant parasitic and free living nematodes. And free living nematodes won't attack plants. They're actually great nutrient recyclers in the soil that you'd want to have. But plant parasitic nematodes have the stylet on top of their head. That's their distinguishing factor. But they can actually go in and pierce the vascular system of the plant and begin to suck out nutrients. Lance nematodes specifically, they're hoplolamus, that's their genus. They are semi-endoparasitic and ectoparasitic nematodes, meaning that some of them will go actually into the root system to feed completely. And so no part of them will be hanging out. And they're also ectoparasitic, which means they'll attach themselves to the outside of the root and feed that way. So because of that, they're very difficult to manage with nematicides, because if you spray nematicide and it's fully inside of the root, chances are you're not going to hit the nematode that's inside of there or the lance nematode that's inside of there. They have a life cycle of about nine to 18 days, depending on different species. So pretty quick, their numbers can get pretty out of hand. The threshold that we use for actual disease incidence is 200 lance per 100 cc's of soil. So that's when you're really going to start throwing in application methods um, if you're getting those numbers. We actually have a great video that Dr. Miller shot of a lance nematode feeding endoparasitically. So you can see it's stylet right there is the thing that's moving and sucking from the vascular system of the plant. Um, so removing nutrients and along with it removing nutrients, it's also a gateway for soil-borne diseases and other abiotic stresses to go on. So you'd think if you got a cut on your hand, basically you've got a lot higher chance of that getting infected and you getting sick. Same thing with plants. So them breaking into the root system and feeding has basically two effects on that. Why we're really needing to look at that though, is because as you can see in the picture, it's a pretty unesthetic thing that you'd want in a golf course, which is basically priding itself on its aesthetics um, along with its playability. So if you've got a ton of damage coming from it, it's going to really negatively impact the player's experience. The nematicides that a lot of these golf course managers use don't really move that far in the soil profile. So they'll actually, um, abomectin is a great example gets locked up in the organic matter. So it doesn't make it all the way down to where the nematodes might be at a time. So knowing where they are at a specific time would be great for application timing because a lot of these nematicides are very expensive. So if you're spraying it and the nematode is far down and the nematicide doesn't hit it, then you just wasted a good spray. So knowing where they are in peak populations at time of the year is very important to saving money. So going around Missouri, most putting greens are USGA regulation, which means they're made up of everything you see here sand-wise, and they all will be creeping pencrass. And there's different varieties, pencrass, A1 and A4 are the two biggest ones that we see. But there are two golf courses that I actually sample at that are not USGA greens. So getting down as far as you can down to the 10 inches with the soil core can be kind of difficult. Also, sand is a pretty great medium for them to move in because they move through water films in the soil. So the larger pore space that sand will give them gives them more of a range to move around in. So it's not really gonna help them live better, but they can be much more dynamic in their populations over time and where they are. So my research hits at five location cities, 10 actual locations. We have three in St. Louis, three in Kansas City, two here in Columbia, one of them being South Farm, one in Cape Girardeau and one in Branson. So those two South and then the three going across the top. We sample four times a year at these courses in April, June, August, and October. So we can see you know, where they're going at those different times in the soil profile. 
And how we do it is by taking a soil core that's actually pictured right there. We'll go to a golf course and go on its green, its infected green, and pick from areas that are randomly stratified. So we've got random data. We take 12 soil cores at three quarters of an inch diameter, all the way down to a depth of 10 inches. And we measure every two inches and divide them. So that gives us five separate soil horizons that we can actually do nematode sampling on to see how many are eaten each horizon. So the first two inches, I believe what is H1, two to four is H2 and so on and so forth. That ends up giving us about 120 cc's of soil per horizon. We then blend the first one to make it homogenous. So the root systems get broken up and any of the nematodes in there will get broken up as well. So we're not losing any in the count. And then we take it to the elutriator in the soybean cyst nematode lab. It's a semi-automatic elutriator, which is great for pulling out all different types of nematodes. And once we've removed them from the sieves, we do a sucrose suspension, which is a common suspension method used in nematode isolation. And then we ID them on different morphological traits. So looking if we have lance, ring, sting, free living, those are all determined on different factors that they have. Like ring has a bunch of what look like segments going down it. Lance are a lot bigger with a longer, more defined style, things like that. And then another thing that we have going on, and this is at South Farm right by the lake, this is our A1 green. We actually go to one of our St. Louis courses and they will aerate. So not with the soil core that I use, but they have an actual machine that pulls up soil cores, pulls them out of the ground. We then aerate at South Farm and take all of our cores off just with a shovel and get them out of there. Then we bring in the cores from the St. Louis course and scatter them across the top of what we just aerated and then brush them in, hopefully bringing in lands from one of our St. Louis courses. And then I sample during the typical four months time for that. So that's how we've got that going. And you can go see that down at our A1 green. Initial results, this is our St. Louis. The darker colored ones that you'll see on these graphs are from April and the lighter color ones are from June. You can see here that the H1 region, which is that zero to two inches, has the first highest initial numbers of plants, as you would expect. If they're feeding on root systems, you wouldn't see them super far down, but it can change. All of those H3 seem to have moved right back into the H2 come June in St. Louis. In Kansas City, we actually saw some all the way down H5, and that's eight to 10 inches down in the soil. So pretty deep down there as of April. And the numbers skyrocket come June. And they're mostly, again, in that H1 to H2 range, but we still have them down in H3 and H4. So it's pretty drastic change there. You've seen the numbers just over a two-month period, how much more can be in an area, and that might be when you would want to spray. As for our Branson courses down in the south, we've got a pretty even distribution pattern going down the gradient, and the numbers kind of do the same thing coming in April. Another nematode we look at is root knot because it could be economically important as well in some of these greens. So in April, when we sampled in St. Louis, we saw most of them coming into the H1 range. And the numbers again shot right up in June. Could have been a control method thing. It's too early to know if that trend is going to continue or not, but that's what we initially saw. And in Kansas City, we got less root knot, even though we got more lance. And then they all went over to that zero to two inch range. So just trying to feed on the root systems. A lot of similar work has been done by Settle and Fry at Kansas State, but they evaluated population dynamics as a whole instead of at different ranges. So you can see that populations peaked in August in most of these and then steadily declined and then actually went back up in the fall months. They also noticed that most of the endoparasitic populations that they had were only in the juvenile stage versus adult lifestyle stages for the nematodes, which is interesting. They also reported all of their lance nematodes as H. galeatus, which is a species that may or may not be overreported, and we talk about that in a little. Further research that I'll be conducting is my sampling goes through October 2022, so we can kind of get a broader idea of how these nematodes are moving across time. Another piece of work that I'm going to be doing here in Waters Hall is speciating between Hoplolamus in Missouri using PCR primers that are species specific. So like I said, H. galeatus, there's been some recent work done that shows that it might be overreported in different agronomic crops across the United States. And it might actually be H. stephanus is what we're seeing. There were examples of that in Illinois and in Kansas as well, where people initially reported them as H. galeatus, but people went back and looked at them and they were H. stephanus. 
And why that's important is there's conflicting reports on which species will be damaging more to turf. But if we saw some galliatus in the soil that wasn't going to be impacting the turf, then that's very different than, okay, well, we see H. stephanus here, so we need to actually get into gear and start applying nematicides. And then with this data, we hope to improve management strategies with the different information that we've learned about the location and depth data over time. So helping golf course managers all across the state save money is the most important thing about my research. And just some acknowledgements, thanking everyone that's helped me so far with my research along the way. Dr. Lee Miller, of course, my advisor, Daniel Earlywine is our farm manager, does a great job. He's the reason we're able to do everything that we can at the farm. Jeff Berzon and Dr. Caitlin Bissonette at the Soybean Cyst Nematode Lab, they do a lot of great work over there and really help me out with my research. Dr. Fask at the University of Arkansas is one of my committee members, and he's helped me out a lot with figuring out research methods and how I'm actually sampling. And then our two undergraduate workers this summer are Katie Weiss and Anthony Arona. So thanks, everyone, and I'm open for questions.